to his speech and then we'll take up from there. Does someone want to reach over and turn the television on? Bottom knot. Bottom knot, is this one going to be open? No, it's not. Would you like to elaborate on your comments before it starts with that? If he steps down, we can liable to have a military government in this country.
how this new vice president reacts. And how the people react. Could force military action in this country. You got 14 hours for what you say sitting on a powder keg. It sounds good on TV. If someone is going to step in the shoes of the other man as you walk up. But as you know, it's 14 hours. A lot of things can happen. There are many cosmic forces at work. Not the human, but cosmic forces at work. And there are many cosmic forces at work. And those on the outside in other countries recognize our weakness now. The promises they made to him are only as good as the next 14 hours. How they think militaristically what is the condition that will force them to change their thinking can drastically affect us. Right now we are affected by shortages. He calls it inflation. We have a shortage, another shortage. We don't have no grain. We have no storehouse in this country. It's on the ground growing, waiting to be harvested. It's already sold to the men on the other side of the water, waiting to receive it. And if Mother Nature don't give us the climate we need to bring in a bumper crop, we're going to see some real rising action taking place, even with Mr. Ford as acting president. The senators know it. They're shouting already from their heads, different new places, telling the world, telling us it's already here. Spiritual masses have already told us already. We got a couple more years to go by the grace of God before we start a tremendous internal writing program. People are discontent with all forms of authority, good or bad, simply because trade has become the authority to make the world slave economic slaves. Right now in Switzerland there is a computer built and the secure thing about this computer all the money in the Swiss banks used to have names before to the owners and number no longer. They're all piped into the computer now and the only way you can get your money back out is by an identification mark put on the wrist and on the forehead by a laser light. And if you don't have it, you can't claim your money back in the Swiss bank. <laughs> Everyone that has some holdings in the Swiss bank will be forced to have it indelibly set. It can only be seen by infrared light in a shaman. And the heirs of the people are the depositors. When they pass on, that number is imprinted on the heirs from birth. And that's how they'll keep track. We are going to be finding ourselves not controlled by political men, political men are scapegoats for businessmen who pull all the strings behind. Mr. Nixon's base in Congress 
It's not a political support. It's a financial support. Now let us not fool ourselves. Our energy crisis is in all the things that we've gone through. It's in the financial realm. We don't have a solid dollar no more. We don't use gold no more. In the last six or seven months, we don't use gold as a basis for the American dollar. We have what is called a soft dollar now. Since Mr. Nixon has signed by pressure to let gold go on the market to be purchased. I'm not just talking for shock's sake. I have to buy gold to make bracelets for astronomical bracelets. And I was already warned by the, the smelters. You're not going to get it when you want it. And it's not going to be any control in it no more. And anytime we have the whim to raise it or lower it, Congress can do nothing for it. It's all over. Our friends in foreign countries, who may be considered our friends now, realize the situation they're in now. And how they can <coughs> stranglehold us in this part of the world. So, by making us committing ourselves to supply them the necessary grain, before it is even harvested while it's growing in the ground, they have the first priority to purchase. They realize that already. They realize that there are five basic things that they can strangle the whole world, not the United States alone, but mankind. They will strangle hold of mankind with the food. They strangle hold mankind with the oil. Tango hold mankind with a rate of exchange. The tango hold mankind with freedom of travel. And the tango hold mankind with the right to think. We're moving in that direction already. There are only two societies that we have a capitalistic society and a communistic society. At best, they both have faults. Yet within these two societies, there is a third society, a non-profit society. But that's a very small minority on the upswing, on the upgrowth. In the capitalist countries, we have non-profit society, also in the communist countries. The recognition of the non-profit society has made inroads on all levels now. Individuals who are working for the benefit of others in service and their own self-integrity and helping themselves to help others. These are the individuals who are looking inward to themselves for guidance. These are the spiritual in people. Many years ago, I don't know if you've read the autobiography of a yogi, many of you have, many may not have, but when Sri Yukteswar met Balaji and was deeply concerned with Western men and Western men's direction of spiritual growth, Balaji told him that he perceived many saints waiting to be awakened in the West. These saints are among us now. You are the, the seed root of those saints. Glory a long way to go to make the spiritual force effective to hold a balance in the world of the five negative forces that confront us. Greed, anger, lust, attachment, 
ego. No matter what political structure we find ourselves in, or whatever genetic bond we come from, we all have to face these five forces. We are passing through one of the world's most trying times in this Kaliyuga, entering the Aquarian Age. That means we are in the Kaliyuga of the Aquarian cycle. We are entering it with some of the traces of the Piscean defects. We are going to bring all those five negative forces with us. And the only people that can control those five forces and make us slaves to them are not politicians, they are the big boys, merchants, who trade back and forth. So we can be our faith in yourself. Now, I'm not against the merchants, but that's the core. Because once you control the individual's greed, <coughs> by depriving him of what to eat, he gets good you. If you control his rate of the exchange, you get him more angry. You see, once you control those very basic things that are physically and psychologically inherent in every human being, you have a mad, angry humanity that will destroy itself by internal violence. It will take the sacrifice and the foresight of spiritual giants to ward off that particular type of life and its destructiveness. Yukteswar foresaw this. The disciple Yogananda came and tried to build a bulwark. And many other spiritual masses have come and are trying to build a bulwark in every part of the world to set the seeds of sainthood moving against self-destruction. The only alternative Honest men have, outside of, outside of saintliness, is military power. It seems funny that dishonest men, outside of their dishonesty, their next alternative is uh, military power too. If you can be dishonest and still have military power, and if you're honest, you still gotta have military power. Military power seems to hold the balance. <coughs> Very few of us know how to defend ourselves. <coughs> and I don't mean by using arms or weapons. I simply mean using the two physical arms that God gave you. When the great Buddha monasteries were overrun by outlaws thousands of years ago, they came a monk who converted the religious man from a scared rabbit into a roaring tiger by teaching how to use his two hands that even the nuns were afraid. And when they were taught how to defend themselves, men who were bandits never bothered to attack those monks no more or nuns no more. They learned their lesson and there was a great fear of time when everyone began to respect human beings. We are approaching that level. And if we don't know how to defend ourselves with our two hands, basically, we're going to be taken advantage of. It isn't that you shouldn't turn your cheek and someone hit you. Turn the other cheek. 
It isn't that you shouldn't pray. All these forces are available to you. But at the same time, Yogananda said, don't bite what you can hiss. You know, a snake don't necessarily have to bite back to show that it's a, a venomous creature, but it can hiss to make you respect it. We are human beings, and when human beings want to take advantage of us, whatever form it comes, so you have to learn to hiss. So, this country has never faced a military takeover. It was working towards that. In the time of De Gaulle, he managed to sneak in democratic dictatorship as a legal procedure of powers entrusted to a president. Mr. Nixon wasn't that fortunate to let it happen in his time. <clears throat> but if we're turning back this power to Congress and the people are discontent and Congress is manipulated by powerful trade blocks, the military is not going to stand by and maybe that president will be forced or be reinforced by the military. And you know, we say it can't happen here. But let us not kill us as a human being. And if you do like he said, fight to the bitter end, but we realize <laughs> that uh, we, we would have no base or no uh, group to give us the vote of confidence and we will have to switch over. Somehow we will find ourselves in that same predicament. He is already giving us a insight of the years to come of what can happen to us. Master already told us there are going to be tremendous food shortages. The water is polluted. Since 1945 there's not a single American in this country at a grain of healthy food. Sounds like a shocker. Any child born after 1945 never ate a grain of pure food or good food. Those who were born before have the elements in their body to withstand the years to come. Those who were born after 1945 don't have those minerals inside. The children today and the food they eat make them very susceptible the disease is faster and we have more powerful drugs to offset it but we don't have food that nourishes us no more we have food that stimulates the body you know you could eat a piece of bread years ago and you felt enough energy and pep after you eat it and yet if you buy the best bread and eat it do you have any pep after it? Do you realize how much you got to eat to feel some kind of pep to do some work? You don't have pep. You feel tired, feel listless, feel drugged. And this is true. The vegetables and everything, and the water, not. We agreed to allow them to put fluorine in our water simply because they say it's good for the teeth. You know, not one drop of fluorine in your water that you drink ever gets to your teeth. <laughs> the only time it gets to your teeth is when it's passing to go down. <laughs> huh? So, so what good is it doing to your teeth? It's making it mottled. But they, they got to buy it because they don't tell you why they got to buy it. 500 feet below the ground is your water table. And the people who manufacture fluorine, this is a byproduct waste from the alcohol refineries, have to get rid of the fluorine excess by burying them down 500 feet. And when the water table is polluted at 500 feet and it shows up in the upper table, then 
whoever complained that there's no fluorine in the water, go measure your water. It's got fluorine. How did it get there? The 500 water table is already polluted by the, the waste deposits. But the upper table in every area starts to show up. Not too long ago from close to where we are in Texas, radiation showed up in a 40 foot water table. How did it get there? But that's just the start of what is going to show up more and more from the water table. But in the meantime, the aluminum companies are going to bury it in the ground. It's going to show up in the water table all over the country. And to avoid any conflict and saying that they're polluting it, why not go ahead and make the companies agree to buy fluorine and throw it on the top side of the table? It is a very good excuse to say to the general public, you need it for your teeth. What is going on, and that's exactly what... <laughs> there is no way you can argue without or get rid of it. Once it's approved, it goes through. Throw it in so many parts per gallon every day. You know you drink it. Now, this comes as a shocker. You better quit drinking it because you're going to gain weight. Nobody believed at the time when this biochemist was working on a research that fluoridated water mm -hmm. had not one ounce of goodness to your teeth, but had every ounce of badness to make you gain weight. And nobody believed. Anyway, there's a girl, and her father is a biochemist, and he told her not to drink the water that grandmother has in her tap, or use the cokes that the water is made from, or eat the, the bread and the, and the meat that they serve. But take a lot of stuff that they have in the house and go down. And the girl says, oh, daddy. And the son's brother says, oh, daddy, you're a funny daddy. Grandma lives happy in the country. She's well off. And All right. The two of them went, and they spent two weeks with the grandparents. And when they came back, and they got on the scale, each one was 20 pounds over in weight and did not know how they gained the weight. And when the father asked them what they ate, they told him. And he said, you doubt me now, you prove it. They didn't believe him. Anyway, it so happened that the girl had to do a science project for her science teacher. And she came to the daddy and said, Daddy, what can I do for a science project to get some marks? Prove to your teacher that fluoridated water raises the weight of human beings or creatures. Take that as a science test and go do it. Well, the, she went and told the teacher. The teacher says, oh, come on, your dad is way off key. But if you can prove it, it would be a very significant paper and very significant research. But uh, do it on mice and make sure you don't hurt the mice. <laughs> The father agreed to buy 200 mice to satisfy the girl <laughs> for the experiment. But the girl didn't want the father to have anything to do with the research because he was afraid that daddy might pollute the mice or do something chemically to raise the weight of the mice. So they finally located a mice farm run by a certain doctor who supplied these mice there in Texas. And they went to the farm. And the doctor agreed, under the supervision, with the doctor and the girl, his daughter, that they would work the checks on these mice and put them in different cages and feed them the water from the tap, the water from the ground that is coming up, and water from distilled water, regulated. After two weeks of testing, and the results were evaluated, and the paper was turned in. Do you know how many pounds those mice gained? Those that were fed the fluoridated water and nothing else, the fluoridated water, all gained to their body with 20 pounds. And those who were fed the water that came out from the ground, well water, they didn't bother to test it and make sure it was done. They gained about 10 pounds. Those that were fed pure distilled water lost 3 pounds. 
so that the said distilled water with vinegar and honey added remained one pound above what they started out. <coughs> but that was not the only problem. It was two months after. Those that were fed the fluoridated water began to lose their hair. And their skin began to become scaly. And their sight became bad. And those that were fed the uh, water that came up from the spring nearly lost the ability to be very active. Those that were distilled water became slightly lethargic. And those that were fed the water with the honey and the vinegar put back, they remained fairly active throughout the period. We don't have foods that nourish us now, unless you grow them yourself and you're certain where they're coming from, that there are no sprays added to it and the ground is not polluted. Because the foods we are eating, they only stimulate the cells, they don't nourish. That means it makes the cells feel satisfied, but you don't have energy. You don't have pep. You gotta eat a lot of it. We are coming into some very, very serious times. And spiritual people, primarily, are here to eat, to live, in order to live, not to eat. But we may not make that last development at the rate of our pollution, of the very soil and the food that we may have to eat to live from. We we'll have to grow it. And if we can grow it, then the, sun, the soil is polluted, it's going to make it more difficult. The prices have to go up. There is no way we can avoid that now. Once in a while you see S-A-L-E. That's when I want to get rid of something that's already too old and all the vitality is gone. It's been around too long, <coughs> and the preservatives that are put in it are starting to show up to discolor the plastic. <laughs> the, the sales are not going to change our situation, the cost is going to go up more, and our wages cannot go up, proportionately, it will not be possible. There during the war time, you grow your own garden. Do you remember those gardens? Garden for victory? Yeah. Throw away the word victory and better grow your garden for vitality. Change the word from victory to vitality or victory over uh, commercialized slavery because we are facing it already. The seeds have begun of self-destruction. I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom, but I'm trying to merely aware of <coughs> those who are interested in getting out of the psychological and physiological dilemma of self-destruction through environmental <coughs> process that is planned to make us all into commercial slaves. And I have no intention to be a commercial slave for nobody, only for God, if he wants me to be a commercial slave for him. <laughs> <laughs> so, number one, five years ago I decided I was going to get out of this particular condition by acquiring land and growing food. <coughs> I have no other concern, merely to grow food and to house ourselves to work for ourselves and to be capable of defending and healing ourselves because 
I lost the gallbladder a long time for nothing. Then I didn't need to lose it in the hospital, simply because that was the only method I knew how to take out the gallstone. <coughs> and natural methods can dissolve them and take them out. But many of us are so weak from the food that we eat that it's only stimulating the cells and not nourishing them. Therefore, we have to resort to a final surgery. I'm concerned or interested in the very natural way that the body is designed to heal itself. And I don't say I don't accept drugs when it's necessary. But I've never found where once you put a drug inside the body, it's the same after. The drug destroys certain things in the body that cannot be replaced. It has certain side effects. I'm not interested to go fight nobody's war either. But I believe that if you're in an environment, it's a matter of choice what the, that particular karma puts you there for. Each one of us got a karma to be in a certain area or born in a certain area. And therefore we have to face that type of karma. Now, one can be a conscientious objective <clears throat> and by due process of the law, he may be forced to go to jail for his conscientious objection. Better to go to jail for your conscientious objection than to pick up the rifle. Or become a part of the movement without carrying any arms, simply because the country has provided a protective measure against its enemies, thus protecting you and your forebearers. But that's how the karma sets it up. If our parents are protected in this country by a certain military movement and we are the children and we are called upon to defend it, that doesn't say you cannot go into the movement but you can refuse to be around. That's one choice. You have another choice. You can refuse not to bear no arms and go to jail. It's not a bad thing, simply because you believe it to be a peaceful person. It takes a great deal of courage to be a saint. And saints aren't born, they are made by the challenges that face them. And not decrying the fact that you shouldn't defend yourself. I don't believe in defending myself to simply because I want to destroy the other person. Unless a man is seriously ill, or crazy, he's going to shoot an unarmed person. But when it comes to defending himself against an unarmed person, <coughs> I like to be well trained that I can defend myself without the use of arms. So that I know I have an even chance with the person. Also, I'd like to know that I can pray for the person before he gets to that level of self-destruction to attack me. But in order to do that, I must have the physical strength and bodily integrity to do it. So I need the environment and I need the time. And if God gives us the time to do it and we don't do it, then we are at fault and not God at fault. We have a, a little time, not a lot of time. We can fast like years ago to clean up our system. Years ago you could drink water and fast and nothing would happen to your body. But you drink a fluoridated water and fast and all the toxins will go into the bone marrow and you'll be more sick than you were before you ever started. And again, your body will start altering. You start gaining weight. You start retaining fluids. The organs will start to go off their normal equilibrium. So, the third society is growing. It's the non-profit society, the spiritual society, not commune. It's a society of men and women aiming standing on their own two feet and living within the law, within the functions of society, not running away from society, 
but at the same time capable of taking care of themselves on all levels. Tense. They go run down the road without any self-protectiveness or self-integrity. Spiritual life is the same. We, we are going to find ourselves more and more confronting the dollar shortage in terms of earning it. Years ago, we used to say those cheap Japanese equipment that came over here. The reverse is said of all goods when it goes to Japan. <laughs> so, the things are changing. The people are getting smart to themselves, and we are, we are actually backsliding in our shoes. We got to realize that <coughs> we have an opportunity to be spiritual, and we can do a better job. We have all the chances to do a better job than the Orientals. The, or the Orientals gave us the the guideline by starting it in the east. But they made one mistake. They became very spiritual, but they became very dirty. At the same time, they neglected their sanitation. Therefore, they have their diseases. This can happen to us. And that has happened in the commune groups. They're trying to be spiritual and neglecting sanitation. Let us not make that type of mistake in this society. Let us be spiritual. Let us maintain our sanitation. Let us keep up our health. Let us keep up our ability to defend ourselves without resorting to arms. Master Yogananda said in his book, not the autobiography, these were personal notes that he wrote. It is now coming out to the public. The road ahead is called we're going to face tremendous problems because our friends and our enemies are going to be trapped in their own mental conflict and they will begin to fight among themselves and we will be forced to use nuclear weapons. We said tonight that there is a limited nuclear weapon system. But how can you limit it? Where can you limit it to? And who is going to be the first guy that's not going to pull it? But he said, of all the countries that will produce the spiritual giants of the future, and of all the countries that have the opportunity and the possibility of producing the best spiritual giants, is right here in North America. The movement of the young people is the seed of the saints to come. They are changing the thought patterns of the adults already. Some of us are all die hard. We just don't see nothing and we don't want to see nothing. And we're going to be swept away. We're still hanging on to our old ideas. But the young people are seeing it already, but they don't understand it and they don't know why it's happening and why it's coming. They feel it already. The others don't see it yet, but those who can see it are making every effort to correct. The spiritual giants will come out from all levels, and in fact, we will be of such a caliber that as we develop ourselves, The miracles in the Bible will seem like child play in comparison to the miracles that will be performed by the spiritual giants in this country. When we really turn on this divine power in ourselves. Simply because we would have a better background of comprehending these forces from our industrial development and the workings of the laws of nature our education that has brought us this far. Early biblical people did not have that as a backlog. Orientals did not have that. They perform a great deal of miracles. There are a lot going on in the East. They can do a lot. But the average layman does not know why it's going on. His understanding of these laws would be 
superstitious, speculative. We are fortunate that that veil has been torn away from our eyes, our inner mind, by the development along the physical laws that the scientists, the mystic, and the medium are all saying the same thing at last for the first time in different semantics. And we, the inheritors of this wisdom, will move forward much more dynamically to do this spiritual life with scientific knowledge. More, much more than doing a spiritual life based on assumption and hit and miss. When we know what we are doing, we can do it better. When we don't know what we are doing, we are hitting missing and taking it surely on faith. Let us not be in that position. We are given a chance to be born in this world, in this environment. You don't realize why we are born in this environment? By of all people you were selected to be here. You realize it's not your first and last time. You had to be born. You came from some other culture with a craving for spirituality. But also you crave to know the laws of why and how. You crave wisdom and understanding. That's why you're thrown in this society to have the fundamental understanding of the laws of physics. Others don't crave it, but others may die craving it. It's their good fortune. Many Hindus, Hindus and Chinese Orientals are being born with some spiritual craving but a tremendous amount of craving to know the physical laws simply because they're dissatisfied with their sanitation environment. They've polluted themselves that way. We've polluted ourselves with the industrial way. <coughs> we got to make a balanced snuff. We got to take advantage of these two faults and correct it. We don't want to see a militaristic action go on in this country, but we are bordering on it. And we are bordering on a tremendous amount of revolutionary actions among dissatisfied people who don't want no law and order no more. Because to them, law and order is already standing for corruption, advantage takers, and the whipping boy is a politician. When they themselves know that the politician, the dissident elements know that the politician is not the fault. They know who the real guy is behind it all. They know it's the man who's spying and selling and holding the mortgage over your head. He's the guy that ties you together with nuts. And when he can't tie you sufficiently in nuts, he uses the whipping bar to enforce it, because he can't enforce it. So self-security is something we need. They can be honest businessmen too. There's nothing wrong with being honest. All spiritual activity runs as a business piece. They have to. Otherwise, they can't run. But it's based on a non-profit function. The uh, idea is to make us conscious of what is facing us and to work as groups towards those critical moments that may come up. Back there in Thailand, we have a program going in which we are putting aside food and putting aside the land to make it work. <coughs> a year ago when I spoke of the food shortage and the energy shortage of the gas, I was thought to be a crackpot. I lived through the energy crisis and saw a lot of things. But the food crisis is a different thing. We know there is no shortage of energy in the form of gas or oil simply because the merchants don't want to release it. Now we know there is a shortage of food because nature ain't growing it and the land is not turned loose to farm it. And we paid the, the farmers at one time not to farm so that there wouldn't be an excess in the barn. But that happy days are gone. No more land is turned loose, and we don't have no barns stacked up with food. I made a trip from Texas to the West Coast. I've seen barns that are empty, 
that used to be further food than other tumbles. And we are trying to put it together in a natural, harmonious way so it wouldn't be toxic to our system. Another thing is this. If there is a crisis, we have the food to share with those who do not have it. If there is a crisis, I have three choices to do with that food. Share it with others, along with myself, or sit down and eat it all by myself and be a stinker. <laughs> or the third thing, not to store the food <coughs> and wake up every morning and say to myself, whose food I'll eat today? <laughs> so that's my choice, you see. Either to store it or not to store it. Either share it when the crisis comes or not to share it. Or just go and say, now, who do I beat up today and take away? That's the alternative I have left. If we have it to share, we will share. If we have the know-how to sustain ourselves while we are sharing it and trying to grow it, by the time the government decides to do something to make the land more open, we will do that. If there is no crisis, we haven't lost anything, we have gained simply because by the time you go to buy it at that time, you couldn't afford to pay for it. So we haven't lost anything. And this is exactly the situation we're in. I knew back in 1968 when gasoline was selling for 32 cents a gallon and milk had jumped to 98 cents a gallon, I said to a very good friend of mine, the merchant don't like that. You holding back the price of gas and raising the price of food. We are making people slaves. People don't recognize they're being made slaves by raising the price of their food and keeping the price of their transportation down. I said, when the time comes to equalize that, to raise the transportation in proportion to the food, you're going to have a tremendous problem. But the only way you can make the public accept is you've got to put on what is called a fraud. Make them believe there's a shortage. That's 1968. We got to kid the public that there is a shortage to bring up the balance between 32 cents to 98 cents. We are paying almost 50 cents and more for that gas, and a fraud has been put upon us. But the other thing was this that gallon of milk, how much are you paying for it today now? Dollar forty five. Then it gets to two dollars, you know how much that gas is got to go up to. By the time you do that, the thing you have to eat cuts a children, adults, elderly people. The thing you have to drive doesn't affect everybody. Because you can pool and travel together. But then milk goes to two dollars a gallon. <laughs> and then it becomes compulsory to put formaldehyde in the milk to preserve it for the general public. That means they're already killing you before you even go any grave. But it's compulsory. And they put formaldehyde in milk to preserve it. It's in now, yeah. It has to go in it. There's no such thing as... You cannot preserve food and things to keep it in your unless you produce chemicals. We are in that state already. You're drinking it into your system. Now, these conditions, these additives, are weakening the cells. You're not getting the minerals that tend to build the body no more. You're getting weaker and weaker. <coughs> And there are three obvious diseases that are appearing from this particular
chemical poisoning in the food. One, the whipping boy called cancer. They don't know no cause for it, they don't know no cure for it. The cells go rampant, there are all types of reactions inside. And this is coming strictly because the body is being polluted more and more. The next thing that is building up is uh, the heart attacks. More and more, we have heart damage. And the third thing we have as building up is arthritis. Children are already getting arthritis in diabetes, which is a disease not normally seen among children. It's for adults, but these are already occurring in children already. My wife and her hus ex-husband used to grow chickens and sell eggs, and she's a doctor, uh, practice. and she said to herself, she couldn't see where these chickens raised in cages to supply these big manufacturers were healthy. So one day she decided to kill some of these chickens to examine them pathologically. Do you know that every caged chicken has premature arthritis in it? Everyone. And before it shows up, and before it is condemned by the USDA, the chicken soup companies come along and buy them to make it into chicken soup. And if they can't get it fast enough to make Kentucky Fried Chicken, <laughs> it goes down to make fertilizer or it goes to make dog food. But everyone has got premature arthritis in it. Fact. And the egg, you couldn't see a, an egg that looked like a chicken egg years ago when chickens ran around in the barn. The color of the yolk is entirely different than the one that you buy. And they have to keep adding more and more additives for the chicken to get it stronger. But the chicken is not getting strong. It's getting weaker and weaker simply because it has to lay eggs after eggs to keep up the production. But it's not producing healthy chicken. We are not getting food into our system that is nourishing. We are getting food into our system to stimulate the system. Uh, do they put formaldehyde in the um, non-type the instant milk, like Alba, or carnation, to dry milk? Yes, they have to. They have to put some chemical in it, either butylate or some uh, sodium or sulfate. It is compulsory now to put what is called measurable tolerances, that's the term they use, of additives to food in order to preserve it so it can have a longer shelf life. So if you're going to use milk for a future baby in the world and you don't have a goat around, I'd rather you go get yourself all the nuts you can get and grind them up into butter and use the distilled water to make yourself not because it's almost the consistency of human milk and drink it so that your own milk carries this consistency and strength and value for babies in the future. Now these reports are not my making, these are makings of the research department in nutrition in this country. The doctors who were talking at a convention that I attended a few weeks ago were giving this information to a cancer research program and a heart program and the blood program of hemophiliacs. They stated that the blood in the blood banks throughout the United States, 90% of the quality of the blood is that from alcoholics and we do not have blood from healthy people the percentage is very low now you can't store blood too long it loses its potency so if there is a run 
of the slightest or nature in this country. And a hemophiliac, if he don't get blood, he'll die. Not alone a healthy person. We are in a bad shape because the blood that we're putting into you will be from a very low vibratory nature. The way it came from, whatever communicable disease or whatever mentality program is going to transverse to ourselves. We, the reason why we want to maintain our own health, maintain our own garden, maintain our own self-defense system and the therapy system is that we want to be able to heal ourselves so fast that it defies modern science to understand it. You cut your foot and pass your hand over it and heal it and not leave a scar. You can heal burns by new methods that we know today that is called alternate medicine. If a person has burnt his foot, we usually use ice. Today we don't have to do that no more. We can do something even better than that. We take the foot and wrap it up with tin foil and take a very fine wire with a clip and clip the tin foil and to the other end of the wire we take a little probe and attach it to the upper portion of the body away from the burn. And in five minutes all the burning is gone. All the redness is gone in about ten minutes. And it'll it'll scab and you can take crystallized honey and just coat it and leave it for about six or seven hours and the scab will form and will fall off, leaving no scar. Now, here is an interesting thing. I was at this convention of myologists, and there was an MD there, and we were discussing what are the chances of survival and medical care in this country, in a place cut off from hospitals and a drugstore. And the MD said to me, he said, you know, if we had a hundred people to take care of, and just the two of us were the only people who had some knowledge of healing, he said, I wouldn't know what to do without a hospital and a drugstore. I can take their blood pressure and so forth, he said, but if I didn't, what, how can I recommend a prescription? He says, my knowledge is all oriented to surgery and to the drugstore being supplied and everything. And he said, I have 10 useless fingers now and 100 sick people standing in front of me all with different kind of belly aches and cramps and everything. He said, I may run for a boy scout book, but even so, <laughs> the information is to re require some basic he said, and what would you do? I said, well, first thing, I'll control the pain. And the second thing is that I don't need a drugstore because if I'm on a certain area in the woods and there's a willow tree, I'll take the willow tree and break off a twig and give it to the person and let them chew. He says, what for? He says, uh, don't you know? He says, no. A willow tree is a willow tree. Who wants to chew on that? He says, well, Mr. Bear is a smart guy, you know. He sold you a bill of goods. It's called bear aspirin. Where do you think he gets salicylic acid from? <laughs> he extracted it from that willow tree and packaged it and sent it to you in a nice blue bottle and you expend it out for so much to your patient. I can't afford Mr. Bear, but I can afford a willow switch. <laughs> but that's where a salicylic acid is. You just go and take your willow, break it off and chew it. <laughs> you have a walking drugstore all around you in your grass. If you recognize it, it's all there. That's the type of information we want to know. That's the type of survival plan we want to know.
where and how to use the various stoppers. We are walking and kicking and calling. Uh, what do you call it? Weed. weed. <laughs> you know, there's a book called My Doctor the Weed. Hmm. Not too long to me. But that's the weed. But that's the weed we kick about. Water. Uh, a lot of things that uh, we will know. For instance, if a man fell and injured his hip and didn't break it, and the doctor is not an orthopedic, he wouldn't know what to do. Or he can just put the guy to light up. He wouldn't know how to pull the hip back. He would have no knowledge of putting that hip back in place. Not alone if the man twisted his neck. He wouldn't know what to do. The man would be in pain. He wouldn't have no salicylic acid in the form of beer aspirin to give him. In. He wouldn't have no ice to give him to bring down. There may be cold water running from some creek, but as far he's going to be limited, very limited, because he has put himself in a position to be cut off from nature, and he's dependent on the merchant production. The alternate medicine is the one that doesn't depend on the merchants to help him. He's depending on his knowledge of nature and how to use. Now, any pain in the body can be corrected by your finger. It's interesting. And if you have a pendulum, or you have a magnet, you can adjust a neck out of this position, or a hip out of this position. And you can cause the bone to pull itself back together, but it will not fuse. But you have to put a splint around it, but it will pull it back, you will not have to string. And those are medical oddities. <laughs> and there's a lot of signs that a medical man will think you're a freaky or a quack or something. But you see, the medical man is not trained to understand that muscles and bones follow the laws of magnetism. All you understand are they are just minerals or the tissue. If your neck was out, you will walk around with a crick. And all you had was a magnet. And if you are shown how to use the magnet, the neck will go back in place. If you're a chiropractor, you can adjust the neck. If you're not a chiropractor and you knew how to hold the neck in a certain position and just press on a certain reflex, the neck will slip back in place. If you knew how to bend the foot and arch it, it will cause the neck to slip back in place. Primitive man had to rely on nature. Nature made these things with it. Medical men only came along and then they compartmentalized it. We're not condemning them because that's the way they said it. We're trying to help the individual to learn these things and that's why we don't know how long or how soon. That's all right. Yeah, you'll be okay. <laughs> they will... Uh, we will find ourselves with a condition facing us. The masters, they all said around 76 is the most critical year so far. Mr. Nixon merely hinted. He has a few things he knows of his sleeve, but he ain't telling me. Hmm? Then he said, in, in two years ahead. He knows what's going to happen two years ahead. Those Israelis and those Arabs are not going to stand still. And the Russians are not going to stand still for the, the action in the Middle East. But he knows that already. Where it's going to be the biggest breakthrough.
but don't look gloomy. There are a lot of wonderful things and they think you have time to do something. Uh, <laughs> the meditation and the opportunity to uh, put aside enough for where you are. You have time. You have time. Groups who, it's just easy to really remember, in, whenever there was a crisis in any time, who were the groups that really stuck together before government ever, ever did anything? Do you know it was always the religious groups who would actually, in 1914, and 19, uh, war, and the 1940s war, it's the religious groups. Now your religious groups are more aware of what is happening. And the Seventh-day Adventists already have stores of food stacked away. They're not trying to impress you no more and tell the world, come. The Seventh-day Adventists are putting away stores upon stores. The Mormons have already stored up a lot of it already. The uh, Quakers are putting away now. The Mormons. Oh, the Mormons were put away a long time, really. Yes, for years. Yeah. Yeah. They used to put away for one year, now they're told to put away for three years mm. by the teachers. Mm. And not too long ago, this was an interesting thing that happened in uh, Dallas. One of the ward bishops came through to give a talk to the Mormon church. And a friend of mine attended the meeting, and she knew that we were storing food, and she attended the meeting. When the ward bishop got up on the pulpit, he looked at everybody. For a few seconds, he said, The time has come. In three months from now, we all have to prepare to move on to our place in Missouri. So get yourself ready to travel. Lock, stuff, and bar. She said you like a pin hit the floor. Mm. Everyone was taken by surprise. And then the, and the reactor was like, he says, don't be alarmed. This is just an alarm, false alarm. The next time I'm by, it's not a false alarm. This is to prepare you. You don't have much time. And if you're ready to go, just tell your boss you're going fishing. So if you're working with some people and you see a mom and tell his boss he wants to go <laughs> the boss gonna give him time off and dock his pay, but don't worry to pay you, take off too. Because he knows where he's going. He's going to Missouri. To certain areas that they own. Where they're gonna be able to weather the storm or what is coming. The areas that is in this area, the only place would be safe is in the mountains, not by the seashore. <laughs> the mountains are the only areas to go. And I would suggest that you put away some like a spare, like a spare tire, even if you don't have to use it. To at least you got it. Be somewhere in the woods. Where, uh, try and get away. Make sure that you can go away from the city because the city is the first place they are. I was in Richmond not too long ago last year when they had that uh, problem in Richmond. And they wrote the, they closed down the, the bridges and they had this slight hurricane that went through there. And I drove in with my car and as soon as I crossed the bridge I saw the military behind me and they were shutting down everything. And I barely made the bridge before they closed it off. And I looked back and I saw the man where you going? And he told me where going. And then I heard on the radio what had happened. And just out of curiosity, this was a Friday evening, just out of curiosity, I went down with my host Saturday in the downtown area to see the supermarkets. We were talking that night. The supermarkets were open. But you know, there's not a single thing inside there you could eat. 
This is Saturday morning. Friday night, practically everything that could be eaten was bought up. And what couldn't be eaten was left. And that was what the merchants were left holding in the store. You can eat glasses, and you can eat forks and spoons. But what could be eaten was all taken and gone. There was a strictly a run on the food. And then there was a condition of holding coming up. Folk medicine is just coming in back on its own. We are slowly now trying to compile all this data and we're holding retreat sessions to teach the individual to use it. So in Texas? In Texas. But uh, we hope that then we, we have all this data, we can send out manuals to the various groups that they can, the basic uh, survival manual. Not only in the herbs and the food and the water, but uh, the therapy manual. And we have enough, <coughs> but the time is still running short in this. Not panicking, but uh, as you say, the longest journey begins with the first step. <coughs> one should think that we does not drive a car without a spare tire. We can't leave ourselves stranded in our homes merely with a few cans of food that is not going to serve us properly. We need food that nourishes us, not food that stimulates us. Because when you get sick under those conditions and drugs are not available, you have problems with blood and the healing, and you need to know how to heal yourself, you need to know things to get the body to heal quicker. So start growing a lot of comfy around your house. Military men, hundreds of years ago, never went to war without their comfrey in their little pouch. And it's the only herb that you can put on top of a wound and seal it, and will heal that wound without leaving a scar. It doesn't require stitching. There's a marvelous chemical in it, yet when you extract that chemical out of its natural synergics, it doesn't do the job as effectively. Yet when you take the leaf and wrap it and leave it, it will do the job. There's something about that particular phenomenon. And comfrey is not only good to heal you, it's good to eat. And in fact, the whole plant, not only the leaves for food, and the leaves from medicine, the root itself, for tonic, for vitality, it goes very deep. In fact, what they're feeding animals in this country now is so as to fatten them up and prevent them from having what is called uh, different type of intestinal diseases. They have begun to feed them comfrey pellets, coupled with the alfalfa. They make these comfrey pellets with alfalfa and feed them now. I was at a farm where they were making it, and we saw it, big blocks of the comfrey pellets. We took the actual roots and everything and compressed it. Now, the people who are making it are not concerned with the leaves. The leaves will give the cow to fatten him up and get him bulky. But the roots are what they're concerned with because the roots are what they're extracting all the medicine from. Now, it's like ginseng. The ginseng leaves are good, but the better part of the ginseng is the root. And the comfrey root is just as potent as the ginseng. And in this country, you can get as much comfrey you want and grow them. Because if you can eat the whole plant, root and leaves and everything. It's food and it's medicine. <coughs> If you got some little place in the backyard, and the next thing, if you can't uh, have a backyard to plant, you got one little room that you can spare, make it into a little greenhouse, make it as a box or something. You know, you be forced to do what is called hanging farming. They grow in buckets too. You know, food grow in little barrels or little crates. You want to have the best strawberries? Don't put it in the ground. Fill a, a little crate or a bucket 
with dirt and perforate it in the side and plant the strawberries in the middle too. You get more delicious strawberries than putting it in the ground. Just hang it. You need very little water and do sprouting. In fact, people should take advantage of Anne Wigmore's knowledge right here in Boston area. She is self-sufficient, she'll never starve <laughs> if <they're laughs> anything should happen because she knows how to survive on the minimum. That's true. Yeah. She's got the seven basic grains that she sprouts to keep the body healthy. And we may find ourselves in that situation. The seven grains? Uh, winter wheat or wheat grass, we need to wheat grass and uh, sunflower seed, uh, buckwheat or rye, that's it. Uh, mung bean, soybean, alfalfa, and uh, lentil. These are the basic seven. And if you use it, now in the wheat grass, you not only have food for nourishment, but food for therapy. Because when we have a depression and a condition of crisis, the human brain will go into a state of schizophrenia. People will get very, very neurotic, very uptight, simply because of the fear and the panic of the possible not able to feed themselves and seeing others who are retching because they can't prolong no food or the body, there's no food around. And the water, your wheat grass will keep your brain from going into schizophrenic state and your sesame seed will strengthen the brain and prevent it from being hallucinated. Sesame or alcohol? Mm -hmm. Sesame seeds. Alfalfa will uh, give you strength. Mm -hmm. the, but sesame seed, the reason why the Turks could not be brainwashed during World War II by the Germans, they didn't realize that they were always eating sesame seeds. Mm -hmm. and the sesame seeds was keeping the alpha level of the brain high, and the Turks would always go into the alpha level. <coughs> couldn't brainwash them. And the only other alternative to a sesame seed is every human being except you is the devil. That's the Jehovah's approach to it. So the Jehovah's Witness, that's their approach to keep you from brainwashing them. If you're not a Jehovah's Witness, you're the devil. See? So you can't brainwash them because man is out to fight the devil. When he got God on his side, who's going to be against him? So you see the psychology works. <laughs> if, you, if you're not a Jehovah's Witness and you come to talk to him, no, brother, you're the devil. Now I'm here to fight you to the bitter end. You can never, you can never brainwash him. You see, and he wouldn't go to war for nobody. He'd go to jail for it because you're the devil. So he's already done know that. He's been programmed that way. So that's one of the psychological uh, immunization techniques against being affected in the schizophrenic or uh, depressive level. Mantra yoga by the yogis is the same thing. There's nothing else here but illusion. So repeat your mantra, repeat your holy name. You see? So initiates have a head start, but the world is not initiates. The world is human beings. And we are not uh, going to find ourselves an exclusive class. We can't just think of ourselves when we're thinking at these levels. We have to think of humanity as a whole. We are our brother's keeper too, you know. When this some crisis is over, do you feel society will resume in the form we know it? Or will there be permanent alterations? Society will break up and decentralize itself from the large cities after these crises. People are no longer going to find themselves living in cities in these crowded uh, ratos. Everybody's going to try and get off to some little green patch wherever it's possible to get out. In fact, Majority of humanity in the years to come will be like the gypsies in their caravans. They don't want to be moving away from the big cities. It is not the big cities may not 
function, but you will not find too many of the uh, big cities being the, <coughs> the entrapment or the allurement for mankind no more. The underdeveloped nations may not survive. They will be totally uh, at the mercy of nature and its whims for growing because their land is polluted by bad sanitation already. They have used human feces to fertilize it, and that will be the detriment. The internal chemical diseases will spread too fast through their society and destroy them. We have been fortunate not to use that to pollute our soil that way, but we are polluting our soil with the deadening of the senses by the type of chemical that we put in the water to drink that makes us ineffective to think clearly. At the same time, it's weakening the sight, it's weakening the heart, causing premature aging in all mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, no, it's reverse osmosis, but I did not get it because the company that uh, they still have a problem. As I said, the, one of the basic problems of that technique was that it's a hand principle and they can't produce them fast enough to and they were trying to find some other way, some alternative to filter water. So we have to go to a still. To distill it? Yeah, distilling it. Using a, dist a still to distill it. How about the output of all the dehumidifier? It'll work. It'll work. It'll work. The, but I would say, try and use the water, not from your tap, because it's already got the fluorine in it. There's one way that you can uh, help yourself with the tap water. Fluorine is a gas, right? Mm 